Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to the Kelly Writer's House. The first thing we need to do is put our hands together or our fingers, whatever your preferred way of praising someone is, to welcome John Keane back to the Kelly Writer's House. That's a warm welcome back to Philly. And Herm's got to cut that phone out. Is that no? So, okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hold this up. Please turn your phones off. Uh, welcome, welcome back. We we're honored uh, to have John here as our first Kelly Writers House Fellow for 2019. Um, John arrived this morning and spent uh, the whole afternoon with the students in the Kelly Writers House Fellow Seminar. And one of the students, I won't say who, because she'll get embarrassed, said, uh, "John." It was so emotional. It was a very powerful experience to spend all that time with John. Um, so uh, that was great. Thank you, John. Uh, and now we're going to, about in a few minutes, ha have the treat of a reading from John and gasp. He's reading something new from a new, can I say it, novel? A new novel. <laughs> Sorry, I said it already. A new novel. Um, before that, uh, Lily Applebaum has a special gift for you, John, and actually a gift for everybody in the room. How many gifts did you make? About 50? 45. 45. So 45 of you can get one of these, and I think there'll be a chance for John to inscribe it. I've sort of given away what it is. Um, and then after that, uh, Husna Hashim is going to do the introduction to John, and then John will read. Um, after that, we encourage you to go to back there to Isabella Simonetti, who's waving now, if you can see her. And she's got, we've got copies of the brilliant, groundbreaking, earth-shattering counter-narratives. Uh, we've got this book. And we've got uh, 1995's uh, annotations, an experimental memoir-ish novel, really stunning. We've got two of those. And if you buy them and come here, I think John would be willing to inscribe that for you. So thank you to uh, many people. I won't list them all. Um, those people at the Writer's House who make Writer's House Fellows possible, it's a complicated thing. Most of all, to the Kelly Writer's House Fellows Seminar uh, and Program Coordinator, Lily Applebaum, who's right here, who is absolutely fantastic. She is also a meteorologist <laughs> and has been spending a lot of time thinking about the weather. Speaking of weather, I will say that tomorrow we are back here with John, uh, 10 o'clock uh, brunch, uh, yummy brunch, and at 10.30, uh, John and I will be sitting behind a table and we'll have another meeting like this, except it'll be a conversa interview conversation. And I know a lot of you have already said that you're coming, but uh, for those of you who aren't aware that we're back tomorrow, please join us. It's a really, really great program, a chance for one hour exactly for us to do a lot of uh, Q&A, talk to John informally about his work. And we'll be looking pretty closely at some of the texts. So that's tomorrow. Another thank you to Paul Kelly, who is not here tonight, who is uh, the, uh, the writer says is named after Paul's parents and his family. And he also, in addition to all that support, uh, gives us an ongoing grant to make Writers House Fellows possible, which is a chance for us to bring eminent writers into this, I was about to say teeny weeny space, but it's actually a, l a little bigger than it used to be. So thank you to Paul Kelly. So Lily Applebaum, you have something for John? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lily Applebaum. I want to echo um, Al's thanks for coming out in the gross weather. I'm really happy you're all here. I am a meteorologist, so if you have any questions about the weather, um, <laughs> feel free to ask. Um, if it's your first time at Writer's House, we have a guest book that's in the living room currently. We'd love for you to sign. Um, the gift I have for you, John, um, <laughs> we have a wonderful, wonderful letterpress studio coordinator, printer. She's shrugging, like all of these titles apply. Mary Tassolo, who did an incredible job um, printing the final um, paragraph from your story, The Aeronauts in Counter-Narratives. Um, it's a really beautiful um, 
poetic final paragraph that ends with this very uh, open-ended final dash. And it's kind of about um, getting up in the air and finally looking at the country that you've lived in um, for a long time from the air. And so we had a really wonderful class where we close read this paragraph and we decided together that it would be a really wonderful piece to print um, for a broadside. So we um, have about 40, we have 45 um, copies and we'll have them in the back where the books are, but I want to present this one to you, John, <laughs> and say thank you again for your visit and just for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I'd also like to call up Hasna Hashim, who is a student in our Writer's House Fellow Seminar, and she is going to properly introduce John Keane. I would like to acknowledge that all who reside in the northeastern woodlands are actively standing, sitting, sleeping, living, breathing, working, destroying, building, and loving in Lenape Hawking. This is the land of the Leni Lenape Indians, specifically the Unami, or the people who live downriver the indigenous people of Philadelphia who occupied this land for over 10,000 years before the onset of settler colonialism on Turtle Island. Because the Europeans could not pronounce Lenape, they called the Lenape peoples Delaware Indians. After turning an unsigned draft of a deed from 1686 into the walking purchase deed of 1737, William Penn gave legitimacy to this unofficial document, hiring runners to walk what would span one and a half days, leading to Penn's accumulation of 1,200,000 acres of land. After the deed, many Lenape were forced out. Only 985 of the estimated 15,000 to 20,000 Lenape to have existed in Lenape Hawking in the 1600s survived multiple relocations westward, many ending up in Indian Territory or Oklahoma. I pay my respects to the elders, nurturers of this soil past and present, and to all of those with us today spiritually, physically, and emotionally. My opening with an acknowledgement of the historical violence your body and my own impose upon this land is a calling in to a particular ideological framework, one of inevitably grappling with what it means to navigate this space forever as an outsider. We can centralize this acknowledgement further. We are within the ivory tower, on the campus of an Ivy League institution founded on the barred entry of a non-consensual forced labor of my people. This is the reality our, of our existence. By vocalizing a buried reality, I implore you to dig into the discomfort. What does my offering of this counter narrative do to you physiologically? Perhaps your bodily response is one of unrest, guilt, or lack of accountability. In the Kelly Writers House Fellows Seminar, my peers and I read annotations, counter-narrative stories and novellas, and selected poems from Seismosis. Our first class session began with a profuse discussion of what it means to counter. I consider my opening land acknowledgement to be a counter-narrative, a challenging of a dominantly held narrative through the offering of an alternative interpretation of an event, fictitious or otherwise. It also means allowing for the fluidity of history. And John Keane's counter-narratives, stories take place in footnotes, side by side, etc. Syntax is distorted. An entire genre is created around the theme of existing in contrast, although not necessarily in opposition. Topics and questions raised in class range from ambivalence surrounding how to read the texts, what it even means to read, memories as imperfection, microaggressions, the ethics of the reader assuming they are the target, disjunction, and reclamation. We had the opportunity to wrestle with all of these topics while in community, an experience I'm forever grateful for. In the largely experimental novel annotations, John Keane keeps a lyrical literary metronome in tune to the beat of memory, memory being an innate somatic knowingness entirely separate from detail. 
reminiscent of fellow MacArthur Award-winning poet Claudia Rankin's repetitive usage of the second pronoun you and citizen in American lyric, the intentionality of pronoun distortion adds to the lack of necessity for specificity in Keene's novel. Instead, what becomes important is the baseline feeling of remembrance, a feeling that readers can relate to by virtue of being human beings, which says a lot by saying so little. Keen tends to open the sections of his books to the inclusion of quotes, most notably to me in this context being a quote from Lynn Higinian, what memory is not a gripping thought. By understanding memory as something that holds on to and or holds on to something or someone, the various narrator's headspaces can be better followed. As a black poet amongst many other things, my connection to Keen reaches far beyond appreciation. The opportunity to witness someone of such likeness and difference create successfully is immeasurable. Historically, black culture workers, particularly writers, have not been afforded the luxury of writing unhinged from the boundaries set by white artistic narratives of respectability and correctness in the same way white artists have been. Therefore, Keene is a figure who is considered revolutionary, groundbreaking, even a first, simply due to the fact that he embraces unhingedness and literally counters expectations of what his work should or should not be do doing. Identity is oftentimes centralized regardless of whether or not the artist's work is directly um, dealing with topics of selfhood, which is arguable within itself, considering the fact that all art ultimately is produced out of an individual's consciousness or lack thereof. This reality in no way detracts from the brilliance of Keane's writing. Conversely, it strengthens the argument for the necessity of recognition of artists from the African diaspora, in addition to various artists from non-Western dominant cultural and linguistic contexts, as articulated by the intentionality behind Keane's other works such as translation. The crux of the argument remains the same. The paradoxical luxury of imagination reinforces a lack of access to an inward socio-political gesture as produced by non-white culture workers. Keene's work demands attentiveness. Perhaps it was deeper than imagination all along. Perhaps the anchoring of Keene's artistic practice in the experimental and the intentional intensifies his ability to break down barriers of expectation. I would like to thank my classmates for challenging and supporting my ideas and Al, Lily, Amber, Rose, and Anna for facilitating conversation. It is my great honor to introduce John Keen. Thank you. Okay, so I just have to begin by saying that, you know, I've had many wonderful introductions and uh, I've said it before, you know, after that introduction, I probably should just sit down. But that is, that was really one of the most amazing introductions. Thank you so much, Hasna. Thank you. Thank you. I, I mean, on so many levels, thank you. I also want to thank Al, uh, Phil Reese, Kelly Ryder's House, Lily Applebaum, Andrew Beale, and every single person who made it possible for me to be, be here with you tonight. Um, many thanks to you, Penn, and thanks to all of the amazing students in Al's class. We had a, a real conversation, I thought, today. And, I, I, you know, I love, of course, I teach, and I'm always in conversations with students, you know. Um, but it's always good to be able to go to a different institution and hear what people are thinking and puzzle through things and uh, sort of talk through things myself, because I always learn something. So I learned quite a bit today. So thank you. Thank you so much. And also, thank you to everyone for coming out on uh, this cold, sleety night. Fortunately, there is no ice storm, right? Uh, you know, I, when I was um, heading down here, you know, I kept hearing all of these, like, scary stories about what was going to happen in New Jersey and what was going to happen here. But fortunately, it's just been a little bit of snow. So I'll knock on wood that, you know, we don't get any more than just a little bit of snow. As Al mentioned, um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a new uh, project. Uh, I'll call it a new project. I guess it, it, it may be a novel, it may be a novella, I don't know. It's a work of prose. And uh, let me just say a few things. Um, when, I was, when I began working on this book, um, we, were, we had a different uh, administration. And uh, I was kind of thinking about uh, some of the effects 
of the kind of larger social, political, economic traumas that we go through again and again and again and as, Amer as Americans. And um, I don't think I envisioned what we are in today, though in a sense, I mean, if you read counter narratives, I mean, I, I guess, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the present is present in the past. But I wanted to try to try to go in a different direction and to think more speculatively about, um, you know, um, kind of these psychic traumas and how they might manifest themselves. So anyway, this uh, project is called Wound. And um, what you need to know is the speaker is a teenage boy who had lived in Chicago. Uh, his family originally lived in New Orleans, and he was his mother moved him and his siblings to Chicago. Uh, and then um, he is now at this in this section living in D.C. with his grandmother. And he is, as you'll see, uh, in love with computers. He does not like to go to school, and he uh, suffers from diabetes. Okay, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say. I think that should be okay. So here it goes. I didn't speak to mom for a week after I got to Big Mama's, though she called every day. When we spoke the first time, she sounded like her voice was as thin as a wire. She sounded tight. Big Mama said, your mom is going through a lot right now, so you're going to stay with me, and we are going to get you together. We're going to get you together. She keeps saying that looking at me like I'm barely hanging on, like mom looked like looked when I was in the hospital. Big mama works too, but only one job, and she's home much earlier than mom ever was, and she cooks. She cooks, and she cleans up, and she makes me take my medicine and do my glucose test, and she looks at my eyes like she can see something hidden in them. She looks at my eyes and my hands and asks me in the morning and the evening, how do you feel? That's what she asked me several times today. How do you feel? How are you feeling? Big Mama's apartment is a little bigger than Mom's, and I have my own room. It was Big Mama's sewing room, she said. But because of her arthritis, she doesn't sew as much, so I got it. And she cleared out most of her stuff by the time she brought me back from the airport. I unpacked my suitcase and backpack, and my boxes arrived a week later, and I unpacked them, and now the room is mine. All my stuff is in the room, which is smaller than my old bedroom was, but it's mine. And Big Mama has her own bedroom on the other side of the wall. Sometimes before I go to bed, she peeks her head into the bedroom and says, how are you feeling? And I tell her I'm fine. I feel fine. I feel like I did before. I never felt bad. I just hated going to the old school, just like I hate going to the new one. The kids don't move as slowly, but they're still slow. It's smaller, so they call Big Mama whenever I'm not there, and she calls the cell phone she bought me and is paying for me, is paying for to make sure I'm in school. I have to text her to say I'm in school, which is why I started gagging again sometimes or throwing up. I would get out of bed, and all of a sudden, I had to throw up. I had to vomit, and I would say, Big Mama, I don't feel like good today. And she would say, are you sure, baby? And I would ask to stay home so I could rest, and I'd tell her that this sometimes happened at home, but I was okay. The first time, she didn't believe me and took me to a new doctor who ran a bunch of tests. He had me test... He had, them, he had them test my blood and check my medicine. He had them check everything, and he told Big Mama on the phone, he doesn't seem to be any sick, or perhaps something doesn't, didn't agree with him, but keep an eye on him and don't let him overexert himself. Don't overexert yourself. I told Big Mama that if I had to be careful and had to miss a few days, I should at least have a way to work on school projects. Okay, let me just stop here and say that he had a computer that he was doing all kinds of stuff on, and his, it just, his mother disappeared it. Okay. Okay. Don't overexert yourself. I told Big Mama that I had to be careful and had to miss a few days. And since I had to miss a few days, I should at least have a way to work on school projects and asked her to buy me a computer. She said, your mother said not to. No computer. Absolutely not. And I begged her. She said, your mother said that computer, I got you, got you into trouble. But I begged her. I need it for school. I need to keep up. She said, not now. After a while, after my throat got sore, my fingers and my toes got sore, after I felt dizzy and had to miss school to not overexert myself, they would be pushing me too hard in gym or on the playground. They would be pushing me, and I would stumble, and Big Mom was going to call an ambulance, but I told her I would be fine. Just let me take the day off. 
I can always catch up, especially if I have a computer. Big Mama said, I'll get you a new computer, but you have to promise me not to abuse it, okay? I promised her. You have to promise. And I promised I wouldn't abuse it. I wouldn't misuse it. I promised her I wouldn't do any of the things I'd done. I'm going to school except when I'm sick, and she can always call my school to make sure I'm there when I'm supposed to be because at this new, new school, if I turned around in the vestibule like in Chicago, as soon as I did, someone would say, excuse me, Shamar, where are you going? What are you doing? And Shamar, aren't you supposed to be in class right now? And Shamar, do you really need us to call your grandmother Ms. Mars? The one security guard or the principal who's always in the hallways, the assistant principal or one of the teachers who isn't one of mine, or the hall monitors would say, excuse me, Shamar, saying my name like they own it, and I'd get demerits and detention, and they'd be on the phone in minutes with Big Mama. So I keep walking straight to my class and sit through the talking and the questions and reading aloud and sometimes stare at my notebook or scribble or write some code or things I mem memorize online from one of the podcasts or free classes. And before I know it, the school day is over and I can walk to Big Mama's house instead of taking a bus and I open the door and go to my room and there it is waiting for me, the box with the new computer. I've only managed to retrieve about half of all the stuff on the computer mom threw away or hid. She won't tell me what she did with it. And I talk to her every other day and she's still tight, but not about me, not with me. She's lost her second job and she was behind the rent and helping Sharice pay for school and Big Mama had to send her some rainy day money and she said she was feeling so desperate she might sign up for the army and go overseas. Anything would be better than this and I thought she was joking but Big Mama said, your, mo your mother doesn't play. Don't you know that? Mom doesn't play. I know that. And she won't tell me what she did with my computer. And I wanted to t I want to tell her that all kinds of stuff was on there, stuff that probably shouldn't get into other people's hands, maybe even some bad stuff, depending. But she won't tell me what she did with it. And I can't tell her what that bad stuff was, depending. I don't even know what it all was. I had downloaded it or torrented it and intended to get to it until I got sent here. She says she's coming to visit me when the summer comes. And maybe she'll tell me then. She won't tell me if I get to come live with her again, but Sharice will be back, so the apartment will be full, like when I was smaller and Sharice was still in high school and we shared a room, and she complained sometimes if I saw her in her bra and panties, and I had to close my eyes. So maybe not. It's okay. I like living with Big Mama. I like living with Big Mama. Even though she checks up on me a lot, she asks me the same questions over and over. She makes me turn my music down and says over and over not to look at pictures of naked people online and to go to bed or at least turn out the light by 11 p.m., but I usually get up once I hear her snoring and play on the computer till 1 unless I'm tired. I like living with Big Mom because a lot is just like it, Mom, except Big Mama never gets too angry and she never yells and she basically lets me do whatever I want so long as I take my medicine and do my tests and go to school and keep my music down, except when I tell her I'm not feeling well. I try to go to school most of the time and only plan out being sick every couple of weeks. I plan out the schedule and I was worried she'd figure out what was going on, but she hasn't. She just says, don't overexert yourself and checks my results and watches what I eat, lots of vegetables and no candy, and asks how I'm feeling over and over again. Don't overexert yourself. On my new channel, which is better, or my new computer, which is better than the one mom threw out or hid from me, I don't know. I only have some of my music files, most new versions I downloaded since I got here, and some of my bookmarks that I remembered. I logged into all of my old sites, my RSC channels, my SNS sites, the social media platforms, the forums and user groups, 4chan, my blog, which I haven't updated in a while. Though I posted a few pictures of Howard University, which were not that far from, with captions in reverse Arabic. Let's see who on my follow list figures that out. Everything had just been sitting silent for the entire time I didn't have a computer. I don't have any of my old text files, only new ones. On my new computer, I don't have any of my pictures, including the porno ones. I didn't dare put any of that stuff on the cloud, and I haven't downloaded any except a few I happen to come across surfing, but mostly I haven't thought about them that much. I don't have any of the screens of code I practiced or wrote, or any of the lists of passwords or secret directories, though I found a few new ones. On the new computer, which Big Mama said costs less than the old one because she's got a senior citizen's discount, but it's more powerful, a lot more powerful, I found a few new sites, but I can't remember all the old ones, and some of the sites I used to go to are offline, or maybe I didn't mem uh, memorize the URLs properly. I can access all of the online games I used to, so that's not a problem. All the time, I keep finding new ones, so I go between my old ones and my new ones. I can't find some of the old ones, though, like the Austrian skinhead zombie one. Maybe they took them offline. 
but I'm always finding new ones. And I try to play them either right when I get home, because when Big Mama gets home, I have to do my homework while she watches TV or reads a book or talks on the telephone. She wants to watch me doing it. I have to show it to her. I show it to her, and she tells Mom, yes, Rochelle, he's doing it. And sometimes Mom asks, are you doing your homework or just trying to fake your Big Mama out like you did me? Mom asks me that, and I tell her I'm doing it. I even read it aloud to her, and she doesn't say anything, but I think she believes me. I'm coming to visit in June, she says, and I want to see all that homework in a pile. I'm not faking anybody, I say. I say it'll be there, and it'll be here. It's all in one of the boxes she sent my stuff in, all in order so she could go through every single class, every single day, every single month. I also play the games once Big Mama's gone to bed, but I have to stop around 1 a.m. or I get too tired to wake up, and the Big Mama says, I can tell you've been up all night, and if that's going to be the case, then that computer will have to go in my room. This happened twice. I didn't want to wake up, and I didn't act like I was sick. And Big Mama looked in my eyes and said, you've been up till all hours. She could tell, and she threatened to move the computer to our bedroom. So I set my cutoff time at 1 a.m., and even if I'm advancing to a new level, I make sure to stop and sign off no matter what so I can get up, get enough sleep to wake up without a hitch when morning comes around. By the time Big Mama comes into the room this morning to wake me, I've already opened my eyes. I've already opened my eyes and turned over several times and slid back into the arms of sleep. A sleep so light, though, that it, all it takes is the touch of her finger on the edge of my comforter, and I sit up. She pulls the cover back, pu pulls the covers back, kisses me on the forehead. Big Mama doesn't have her upper partials in yet. She doesn't say anything. No good morning or time to get up, or did you sleep well last night? Instead, she's humming an R&B song, something I heard Mom play when she used to have a CD player. Mom used to play this song, and a lot of others like it. When she still had all her CDs and records and CD player and serial set, she still di she didn't believe you could play music or listen to it on a computer. She still doesn't. But this is all before the floodwaters took everything but our lives. This was a long this was a long time ago. The first time we lived in Chicago, where I was born, before New Orleans. She sold a bunch of those CDs and records when she lost her job at the store because my brother had gotten into trouble again and she had to take off a lot of time from work to go to court with them, and they fired her. Without cause, she would say. They fired me without cause, but the real trouble, the real cause is the trouble you kids bring, bring me. You create all kinds of problems and you expect money just to fall from the clouds. Do you think money falls from the clouds? I was still really little at first, and I thought she said money fell from the crowds and would ask her why the crowds had so much money. And she'd laugh and say, well, at least you're not a problem. At least one of my children isn't going to dig me in an early grave. That was before I had to go to kindergarten and sit there as a teacher tried to teach everyone their ABCs, which I already knew, and how to count to 20, which I already knew, and all kinds of other stuff that I already knew and didn't feel like listening to again. Mom told Big Mama, I thought I was out of the pits with this one, but I just don't know. I just don't know. Big Mama's humming that song, and her face looks like she's happy, but also concerned. It's always this mixture when she looks at me. She turns around and putters out of my room. She's in her robe, which means she's ahead of schedule. She's showered, and now she's heading back to her bedroom to do her hair and put on her makeup, which means the bathroom is mine. I don't feel like school today, and I've counted the calendar days, and I've gone every day for, two, oh, for over two weeks. I haven't missed a single day for exactly 13 straight week, weekdays. It's almost three weeks, really, and I want to see if I can find and sign onto the game I saw sort of mentioned on one of the message boards last night before I went to bed. It was 1.22 a.m., and I was starting to yawn, and my eyes were closing like they were weighted with magnets, and I was 14 pages into one of the threads on the gaming message board. I always check out. I used to re only read a few pages in, but then one day, back when I was living with mom, I decided to read deeper into one of the threads, and I started to find all these game URLs instead, and there were links to usernames and passwords, or I could find ways to access usernames and passwords, and there were all also were ways to get a hold of credit cards if the games required you to pay for them. All you had to do was figure out where to go. I never wrote this stuff down to use it at a store or buy stuff like clothes or shoes. I could have bought mom and myself and Sharice and Shannon, my older brother, who's in the penitentiary, all kinds of stuff. I could have bought shoes and suits and a house and a car and all kinds of stuff. Some people did that. But I only used the credit card info to get credit card info to get into a game if it required it. That's all I did. I copied some of those some of those to a file I hid on my old computer server. I wish mom would tell me what she did to it. I looked in her closet the day after it vanished. I looked outside right below our window. I looked, I looked in the dumpsters behind the apartment building. I looked in the trash cans inside and out. I went to the basement of the building to see if she'd put it down there thinking I would, wouldn't check. I didn't find it anywhere and I looked and looked. I looked at the garbage out back. I looked in the, I looked in the street in front of the building. 
mom wouldn't say anything. She didn't speak to me till she was putting me on the plane, not in the morning, not when she got home from work, not a single word, not you have to go to school today, or they said you can't come back, or do you realize what you've done is worse than us losing everything in that flood, and I don't care if you run away now and I never see you again. It was total silence, and I sat in the apartment for the entire time until she started packing my bags and boxes and got me ready to come live here with Big Mama. It's not that I don't feel like going to school. The new school is better, but I much more want to hang out here at home today and do my computer stuff. I want to play on the computer today, all day. I want to see if I can find this new game I saw. I want to try it out. I could do it when I get home from school, but Big Mama will want to make me work on homework and then talk to her and then watch the news. You have to watch the news, she says. Like, I don't get it get it from online like you can't get everything online and then we have dinner big mom is always trying to prepare dinners that are part of my diet you can't be eating them chips she says you can't have no more fast food she says you can't be doing what these other kids are doing she says so she makes dinners that are really healthy she's a good cook better than mom maybe not better than but as good as mom and she won't let me cook you shouldn't have been cooking in the first place, she says. So that was better than sending you to pick up fast food every night. But who knows what could have happened on those streets or even in that kitchen. Then she changes her voice and says, I'm not talking bad about your mother. I'm not talking my daughter down. Don't think that. She has gone through a lot. You all went through a lot. we all gone through a lot. But that's a lot to ask of a child. After our dinners, if it's my night to call mom or her turn to call me, I call on the cell phone she gave me that she's paying for. Today is a call day. Yesterday wasn't. When mom asks, I tell her the new school is better. I say that over and over. We'll have to find you a school like that, a school like this back here, she says, but she doesn't say when or which one. Tonight, I'll talk to mom and then I'll watch shows with Big Mama till one, till I say, I need to go practice my math or computer writing or essays on the writing. I'm sorry, I need to go to practice my math or computer writing or essays on the computer. And Big Mom says, okay. She's wrapped up in her show. She says, now don't be looking at any nasty stuff on there. And I tell her I won't. I usually don't ever look at porno anymore. I had some stuff on my old computer, but I hid it in case mom figured out how to sign on. She wouldn't have ever found the hidden folders, I don't think, but someone else might. But they would have had to know my tricks, and I don't think they will. I go to the bathroom and wash my face, brush my teeth. I wash my face again after brushing my teeth. Then I go to the kitchen where Big Mom has set out my breakfast, a bowl of granola cereal with soy milk, a glass of water, and an apple she cut up. I tell, I don't tell her I all I ate when I lived, in mom, lived with mom was a banana or sometimes oatmeal with a banana in it, in it in the winter, the kind you can put in the microwave because it was cheap and mom said you have to have something in your stomach and she didn't understand why I got, had got so sick because she wasn't giving me donuts and Twinkies and potato chips and that much regular soda and fast food all the time. But big mama is very careful and she makes me eat salads and steamed vegetables. We have salads and lots of fruit and vegetables and even when she cooks greens or cornbread or turkey wings, she says it's the healthy kind. Not the kind we would eat, she says, growing up. I sit down and don't say anything about what I ate with mom. I say, Big Mama, I'm not feeling great today. And she says, what do you mean? And I tell her that I feel just feel kind of tired and I think I should get some rest today. And she stops eating her apple and sipping her coffee and says, do you feel warm? Do you have a headache? Are your hands, uh, are your hands sore or swollen? She asked me a whole train of questions. Do you have a sore throat? Do you feel dizzy? You didn't fall while you were in the bathroom. And I said, no, we had a real hard gym class yesterday. It was good. It made me feel good. And I'm just feeling really tired. And she looks at me. She looks at me really closely. I'm not feeling sick like hospital sick, I tell her. I don't have a fever or anything, I tell her. I eat some more of my cereal and then some of the apple and say, just tired, big mama, not sick. And she nods and comes and puts her arms around me. She's got her partial in, partials in now and she kisses me on the cheek. Her cheek is on my cheek. I could smell the cocoa butter and makeup like peaches and coffee she was drinking. She says, Lord knows I worry about you so much. I can feel her words moving through my skin. I worry every single day about you. Lord knows. And then she stops and says, you haven't been out of school in a while. I think it's been a month. And I nod. And she says, I'll call the school in a minute and tell them. And I nod. And she says, you're going to have to stay inside and try not to spend all your time on the computer. I nod. 
I eat a little bit more of my cereal and try not to look too happy. I try not to smile or grin. I finish the apple and say, I won't pick mama. I have schoolwork. And I won't watch TV all day either. And she says, watch C-SPAN if you get bored. (laughs) Or read one of my books. Read my Bible. And I nod. I get my kit, which is in the bowl, in the middle of the table. I do the test, and she watches me. We wait, and she watches the indicator showing everything's okay. Then she hugs me and gets up to get dressed, and I go take my shower and put on my house clothes, not the ones for school, so Big Mama doesn't have to spend extra money washing them. When she's dressed, and I'm dressed, and I'm taking my medicine in front of her, and she's about to leave, she says, you keep your phone on like always, okay? But turn the ringer on since you're not in school. I'll keep it on, I say. It'll be on. And I turn the ringer on in front of her. She sees me flip it. It's charged up, I say. And she pats her purse and says, mine is on too. And you have my number at work. So if you start to feel sick or anything, you call Big Mama right away. You call me right away. Call my cell phone first. If you start to feel warm or dizzy or you start throwing up, or if you feel really sick, you call an ambulance. I'm not, I'm, I'll be feeling better later, Big Mama, I say. I don't want to be sick and miss school anymore. She looks at me. She runs her hand across my forehead and says, you be good today, okay? Don't let anybody in here. Big Mama ain't expecting anybody, and I nod. Nobody, I nod. Don't stay on that computer all day, she says, and she looks at me. I nod. She looks at me and starts to shake her head, but doesn't, and I nod. I watch her close the door behind her. I turn the lock. I go straight to my room and my computer, which I turned on as soon as I was out of the shower. I don't check IG or Snap or TikTok. I don't text or WhatsApp my friend, Arenzi, who's the only one in school who understands half of what I'm thinking or saying and doesn't slap my cap off from behind and call me ill, annoys, or chai racky. I skip all that and flip on the tour, go straight to one of my favorite threads on the Zone Z site, which is based in Japan and linked to new games. On this news group, I found links to many new games or references to game sites that I had to search hard for or references to game sites I'd never found. I've searched sometimes for hours and not found anything from the time I walked in the door after busting out from my old school to the time I started to make dinner before mom came home. It was epic fail. Not a single new game. Nada. I'd bookmark page 14 of this board. I go right to the sub thread that I know includes a link to that link that talked about a new game that's up. It's free. You didn't even need to give a lot of info, but I have files full of dummy info in anyways, and the posters hardly say anything about it, not what sort of game it is or what sort of levels it is or what it looks like or the music or the animation. They don't say who wrote the code and what skill levels you needed. They didn't say anything, which usually means it's the toughest. The less anybody says, the better, because most people would just overlook it. Most people listen to the hype. They don't think things through. They skate on the surface, is how mom would put it. They skate on the ice and don't ever look down and see what's beneath. I was skating on the ice when I was your age, mom said. I was skating on the ice when I met your father, she said. When your brothers were born, when your sisters were born, I was skating on the ice. I was skating on the ice when we lived in New Orleans, mom said, and then I had to look down. We all had to. I went through the page and I couldn't find the link first. I combed through the thread. I couldn't find it. I went back through again, I looked down hard, and then I saw it and clicked on it. The only thing that comes up is, browser cannot find the server or server proxy at www, telling me to check the address, a typical DNS error. So I click the back button, and instead, a new message comes up saying, browser cannot display the web page, meaning the original thread on the Zone Z site with a lot of warnings about how the computer was blocking spyware and my need to download an anti-spyware program. So I try to go back again. I click the back button and the screen says browser is currently in offline mode and can't find the site you're looking for. And I notice that instead of my browser telling me that the page is totally loaded, instead of a complete white error screen, the scroll bar is visible at the right. I've never seen this before, so I scroll down. I scroll and scroll and finally at the very bottom I see a link suspended just above the bottom of the page. I've never seen this before either. None of the games I've ever tried, nothing I've ever linked to, looks like this. I click on the hyperlink and the entire screen goes white. It starts to pulsate like a strobe light, like someone is turning a light behind it on and off my entire screen, and I try to stop it, but it won't. I left-click my mouse, I right-click it. I try several key combos and even hit the reboot button, but the screen keeps pulsating white, 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 white. It's like someone has put a thousand neon lights, a million behind the screen, a zillion lights behind it. It's so bright I can barely look at it. It's like looking into the sun, directly into the sun. My eyes start to hurt. So I close them for a minute, and when I open them again, the screen is quiet. 
It's no longer white. It's a deep purple, so dark bluish purple. It's almost black. It's a color I'd never seen before. A color I think that's sort of like if you combined HTML co colors 461B7E and 151B54 and 000000 together, almost 150517 or 250517, but the other colors are still in there too. It's, it just, it isn't just 000000. It isn't just the dark grays that are almost black, but the other blue and the purples too. The screen is completely still. It isn't making any noise. No more pulsing. Just this dark bluish purplish black like the inside of my eyelids when I fall asleep. And at the very bottom I see a single white dot is smaller than my pinky nail. And when I look closer I can see it's Chinese characters or something. Maybe Japanese and it's just flowing there. Floating there, I have to squint to see them. I lean in real close on my so close my nose is brushing the screen. I've glimpsed this symbol or one very close to it before on threads. No explanation. And once I saw it on a page with strange lines of code, I forgot to copy and paste, and I couldn't find no matter what. How many times I searched, someone must have been deleted and taken them down. And what does it mean? And before I know it, the characters shift to Russian and then to Arabic script and then to a hundred others. Most I've never seen before. Maybe in imaginary scripts and languages. It's like it's an animated GIF file or something. It's moving so fast I really can't make it out. And the Chinese characters, Japanese ones, don't come back. And then for a split sec, split split second, I see an English word in tiny white letters on that bluish purplish black. Letters so small I can barely read them. Then I think they say money and start smiling. Or maybe it says blood, or maybe abyss, or maybe voids, or maybe wound. And then it's gone, and the icon keeps changing so quickly my eyes hurt. And I try to run the cursor over it and fail, and try again and try until it finally it hyperlinks and I click and then I'm in what looks like a green tunnel all colors of green until I realize it's red a red tunnel a red hole a red kaleidoscope a red abyss I've never seen a game background like this is racing in front of me pulling in front of me pulling me into it the tunnel is disappearing into a red void in itself a bloody vacuum pulling itself inside of itself it's suctioning my eyes into its viscousness is suctioning the screen into it it's an optical illusion I know but it's making me dizzy it's moving so fast the colors are changing inside of it so fast inside of each other so fast that it looks like it's a thousand red or a million ones a trillion ones or zillion ones every color inside of red turning into every other color the swiftest animation I've ever seen I've never seen a game like this it's the best because I don't even get what the point is I don't even know how to get in or get out or stop it and I decide I'm going to shut it off I'm going to unplug the computer because my head hurts and I feel like I'm going to puke and I don't know what's going on I really do feel dizzy and on the verge of puke and I feel like I could fall out of this chair right now and think maybe I should eat something, maybe my sugar's low, maybe I should get up and eat something, drink some water, or have a diet soda, or throw up and call Big Mama, I'm really starting to spin, and then I see a small white diet, I see a dozen of them, I see I see hundreds, it's only ten or so, and then one, they're, dis they're appearing all over the screen in different places, very tiny but big enough that my cursor could touch them, and I move the mouse and the cursor's moving again, and it's all over that red void that keeps zooming into itself, that keeps collapsing into itself like a red throat or cave or mouth or vein or void, a red Red, black, a red, black, red, black hole opening into countless other ones like a black hole made up of a, thousand, of a trillion different reds, like a trillion red stars in this hole, a galaxy of red stars disappearing into this red, black hole. And I wonder whether the point is to touch one of the white dots, to zap one with my cursor, to zip the cursor over to one and click it, but it disappears in another and another and another and another and another, a white patch of them, an island or islands of them form, white clouds of them formed. Colonies of them form like fungi or corals, constellations, and for a second the screen goes white again before turning to the red black holing and the dots which keep slipping away the dots I'm missing I keep missing I keep failing I keep missing and missing them a total fail and I, as I concentrate as hard as I can though I'm dizzy and I want to throw up my stomach surges but I focus I go deeper deeper into my head like I always do when I'm playing my stomach is turning over but I go inside in, to the inside of the inside the place beneath the place my fingers on the trackpad are moving so quickly I can can't even feel them anymore the curse suggests as it nears one dot disappearing and reappearing glides away from my control near another and another and then right before one appears somehow the cursor arrow is on it the cursor is on it my weapon is on it my whole body is quaking and frozen at the same time I'm on it and I click and fire and all of a sudden the screen goes white 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 boom thank you Q&A <laughs> Sure. Uh, sure, I can read the short tweet. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I think John's going to read a short piece, maybe from Counter Counter Narratives. Yeah. Sure. I vote for Manhattan. Yeah. Anybody in favor of that one? It's a good one. Yeah. Okay. The only other one would be. Um, yeah, well, I'll read, I'll read Man of Okay. So this is <laughs> a little shift in, um, in tone, um, but taking us back to what Husna was saying, uh, the Lenape. Manahatta. The canoe scudded to a stop at the steep, rocky shore. There was no slip, so he tossed a rope which he had knotted to a crossbar and waited with a pierced plumb square just larger than his fist forward into the foliage. Carefully, he clambered towards a spray of greenery, the fingers of the thicket and his underbrush clasping the soles of his boots, his stockinged calves, his ample linen breeches. A thousand birds proclaimed his ascent up the incline. The bushes shuddered with the alarm of creatures stirred from their leaves. Insects rose in a screen before his eyes, vanishing. When he had secured the boat and settled onto a sloping meadow, he sat to wet his throat with water from his wine sack and orient himself and rest. Only then did he look back. The ship, the younger Tobias, which had borne him and the others across more nautical miles than he had thought to tally, was no longer visible, its brown hulk hidden by the river's curve and the outcropping topped by fortresses of trees. The water fluttering like a silk shroud, now white, now silver, now azure, ferried his eyes all the way over itself east. He knew from the captain's compass and his own canny sense of space, innate since he could first recall to the, to the banks of a vaster, still not fully charted island, his outlines and ochre shimmer in the morning light etching themselves on his memory like auguries. Closer, at the base of the hill, fish and eels drew quick seams along the river's surface. The river's nervous surface. From hideouts in the rushes, frogs serenaded. Once in Santo Domingo, where he had been born and spent half his youth before working on ships to purchase his freedom, he peered into a furnace where a man who could have been his brother was turning a bell of glass, and he had felt the blaze's gaping mouth, the sear of its tongue nearly devouring him as the blown bowl miraculously fulfilled its shape. Now the sun, as if the forebear of that transformative fire, burned its presence into the sky's blue banner, its hot rays falling everywhere, gilding the landscape around him. He was used to days and nights in the tropics, but nevertheless crawled beneath the shade of a sweet gum bower. He turned down the wide brim of his hat, shifted his sack to his left side near the tree's gray base, opened his collar to cool himself, and waited. The first time he had done this at another, more southerly landing near the dock in the main trading post, one of the people who had long lived here had revealed himself, emerging from an invisible door in a row of bayberry speaking, yes, repeating, a soft but welcoming melody. Jan, as Captain Mossel and the crew on the ship called him, or Juan, as he was known in Santo Domingo, or João, as he had once been called by his Lusitanian sailor father, and those like him among him whom he worked, the kingdoms of the Iberians being the same in those days. And before that, mm, the name his mother had summoned forth from her people and sworn him never to reveal to another soul, not so distant it struck him, from the Makadewa, the envoy of the first people had begun to call him had stilled his ear like a tuning fork until he captured it, and with the key of this language that most of the Dutch on the ship assured him they could not fully hear, he had himself unlocked the door. Pelts for hatchets, axes, knives, guns, more efficient than flints or polished clubs in felling a cougar, a sycamore, an enemy. He had wrung a peahen's neck and roasted an entire hog, but despite having heard several times the call to revolt, he had never revealed a single secret or shibboleth, nor had he killed or been party to killing another man. So long as the circumstances made it possible to avoid doing either, he would. Some day, perhaps soon, he knew his fate might change unless he overturned it. 
The envoy had, through gestures, his stories, later meals, and the voices that spoke through fire and smoke, opened a portal onto his world. Jan knew for his own sake, his survival, he must remember it, enter it. He had already begun to answer to the wind, the streams, the bluffs. As he now sat in the grass, observing the light playing through the canopies, the shadows sliding across themselves through the sedge and distinct shades, all still darker than his own dark hands, cheeks, a mantis praying along the half-bridge of a Girardia stalk, he could see another window beside that earlier one, beckoning. He would study it as he had been studying each tree, each bush, each bank of flowers here and wherever on this island he had set foot. He would understand that window climb through it. He stood and unsheathed his knife. Then he removed a roll of twine from his bag. Using the tools, he marked several nearby spots, hatching the tree and lightly, tightly knotting several lengths of string around the branches, creating signs in the shape of lozenges, squares, half circles that would be visible right up to sunset. In nearby branches, he created several more. There was always the possibility that one of the first people whom he expected to appear at any moment, though none did, or some non-human creature or a spirit in any form would untie the markers, erase the hatchings, thereby erasing this spot's specificity for him, returning it to the anonymity that every step here, as on every ship he had sailed on, every word he had never before spoken, every face he had never seen until he did once held. If that were were to be the case, so be it. Yet he vowed not to forget this little patch where a new recognition had dawned in him. If he had to commit every scent, every sound, even the blades of grass to memory, he would. He walked around, bending down, looking at a squirrel that had been looking intently at him. Despite having no timepiece, he knew it was time to return. A breeze, as if seconding this impulse, sighed, Rodriguez. He then began sifting through a store of images for a story to recount to them, shielding this place and its particularities from their imag- imaginations. He broke off two branches big enough to serve as stakes and carried them with him down to the bank in the canoe. Using his, fin- his knife and fingers, and once he had created an opening, the thinner end of his paddle, he dug a hole and pounded the first stake into it. Using the twine, he created a cross with the other branch and strung a series of knots around it from the base to the top, wishing he had brought beads or pieces of colored cloth or anything that would snare the gaze from a distance. He stepped back to inspect it. He was not sure he would be able to spy it from the water, though it commanded the eye from where he stood. But, he reminded himself, once he returned to the ship, it would be for the last time and he would have months, years even, to find and reconstruct this cross again to place a new one. The first people would guide him to it too if they happened upon it. He placed his knife in the twine, he replaced his knife in the twine, collected his anchor, then hoisted himself back into the canoe, paddle in one hand and the other his ballast. He pushed off from the shore out into the river, and as he glanced at the cross, it appeared to flare momentarily before it disappeared like everything else around it into the island's island's dense verdant hide. It was, despite his observations of the area, the one thing he recalled so clearly he could have described it down to the grain of wood when he slid into his hammock that night, and when he returned a week later, his canoe and a skiff laden with ampler sacks of flints, candles, seeds, a musket, his sword, a small tarp to protect him from the rain, enough hatchets and knives to ensure his work as a trader and a translator, never to return to the younger, to, younger Tobias or any other ship, nor to the narrow alleyway of Amsterdam or his native Hispaniola, the very first thing he saw. Thank you. John Keane. John Keane. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John. Uh, yes, we do have two books for sale in the back. Um, John will stay here for a little bit, so if you want to buy a copy, come back here. Um, 
tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We have brunch at 10.30. John and I will be here. Hope you'll join us for a conversation that will last exactly an hour. And you don't have to RSVP at this point, Lily, saying that you can just, the food is all ready. Please come and join us. Uh, thank you so much once more for joining us tonight. And let's thank John Keane one more time. Thank you.